these are sort of Paul's final instructions to Timothy in this letter at least pick this up about verse 11 1 Timothy 6 flee from these things you man of God Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, gentleness. Paul to young Timothy, he says, this is what I want you to do, Timothy, as I'm closing out this letter, my final instruction to you. I recognize you as being a man of God. I recognize you as being one of the faith. I recognize you as being one of his, one of my protégés, one of my fellow co-workers for the faith. So I ask of you, I tell you, I command you, I instruct you, Flee from all these evil things that I previously mentioned. Flee from the things that cause trouble in your life. Flee from the things that cause discontentment in your life spiritually. Flee from the divisions touched on this last time. Flee from the corruptions. Flee from the people that do no good for the kingdom. Flee from the temptations, Timothy. By doing this, then pursue the righteous things. Pursue those things that are pursue those things that are of Christ. Pursue him. Flee from one, pursue to the other. Flee from one, run to the other. Run to Christ. Grip a hold of Christ, he's saying. Hold on to Him. Hold on to godly living, godliness, he's saying. Hold on to this. Do what is right in, in relationship to the one who saved you. Follow him. Hold on to him. I mean, pretty much, he's telling Timothy, listen, Timothy, you've got the option as to what direction you want to go. But I command you to persevere and to, and to search after, seek after the things of Christ. The right living, a godly life, deep faith, he's saying, deep faith. Be faithful, Timothy. Be faithful to the ones that are serving beside you. Be faithful to the one who saved you. Love them, love him. Persevere, Timothy. Persevere. Persevere to the end. Don't give up. Persevere to the end for Christ. Persevere to the end for Him. Have a life of, have a life of gentleness with others. Have a life of gentleness. What do you mean by that? Don't be the one that... Make a side note here. Occasionally I do. Don't be the one that is not gentle in the service for Christ. Have a life of gentleness to others. 
caring to others, compassionate with others, not domineering over them, not look at me, I know far greater than you, but be gentle with them. Be gentle with those that are of the faith. Be gentle with those that are not of the faith. You're and telling them of the truth. Remember and understand that there by the grace of God goes you, Timothy. Try not to be harsh with them. Yeah, fight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're exactly right. That's what I was getting at. You're exactly right. There's, there's a, there's a balance there. Is, and then you know, I've got, I've got a friend who, who's, who, who's a believer, and he takes it to the opposite extreme. I mean, he's ready to, if there's a, if there's a time, an opportunity to argue into. And to lash out and to fight the good faith in the sense of, but he takes the word fight as I mean he's ready to argue, he's ready to just I mean if it if it's blow for blow I mean he gets to this point sometimes and. But you know there's so much friendly fire. Now. Yeah. You know it, it's Christians attacking Christians. Yeah. And then the other end says, well, anybody who says they're a Christian. middle ground there where everybody who disagrees with me on one point is not my enemy, but also everybody who says they're a Christian is not my friend. Yeah, yeah. And it's just, it's either one side or the other. And in the middle, is, it's discernment is what brings you to the right place in the middle there. It's like, okay, well, this person denies Solapita. That's outside of the faith. So, that is worthy of criticism. Well, this person defies the nice soul of day over here, and they say, well, but they claim Jesus, so they're, we're hunting you over. We don't need to critique them at all. But the right answer is in between. It's, okay, well, this person, you know, oh, that Mormon, he, he claims Jesus. Well, no, it's different Jesus. Yeah. We're playing on different teams here. We're playing different sports. And you're exactly right, and that's where the the fight comes in. But what sort with sort of, and, and it's very difficult. You find very few people who are able to truly do it effectively. I believe you know you get the ones just that that just come out just just lashing and just cutting. But the other was that 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 do fight to fight, but they have sort of a a, a way to do it to where they where they're just not, you know, darn near coming to a full-blown argument. And they're earnestly contending for the faith. They're earnestly taking the stand of Scripture. And, and nobody would ever accuse Martin Luther of being Jim. Uh, but he, but he it, was. Yeah. You know, his words, it was, who was he talking to? Was he talking to the Pope? No, mm -hmm. he wasn't. He wasn't gentle talking to the Pope or harassing. But, you know, talking to a Christian, talking to a member of his, con his congregation, mm -hmm. I mean, Luther, it's okay for us to critique Luther. I mean, he didn't have everything right. It's okay for us to critique Calvin. He didn't have everything right. But it's like you got to take so many people, it's, you got to take everything or you can take nothing versus You're, you're, you're exactly right. Understand that. And I've always said, and you're, and, and you're right. I, I've always said this is that, you know, 
it's hard to something that I'm not a big fan of. You see it happen from time to time. Somebody will bring up somebody from the pulpit and just absolutely somebody that's maybe held in high esteem or, it's, or whoever he is, you know, as far as service for Christ and has been a servant for Christ. And just like you said, they'll pick something out that he has done in the past and just absolutely just for the next 10 minutes just rip into the guy. But, you know, and then you hear nothing of the back end of it. And, yeah, yeah we're, we're all – we're all sinful men. We're all saved by grace. Nobody has it 100% correct or had it 100% correct. I've always said this too. Those that have the biggest platform are those that are going to take them take the biggest shots. I mean, their life is wide open. I mean, they're going to take the shots. You know, it's one thing if you know you don't have a big platform, or you could sit there and just take a shot at everybody who has a big platform, if you will. But it's, it's, it's a very dangerous, especially to this day and time, where social media and everything is the way it is now. You know, it just we, we take something that somebody said and we and, and we don't agree with it, or we know it's wrong, and we just we just rip into them and and just pretty much with devastating effects, whether the person's still alive or dead. It had to be. Yeah. Take hold of the eternal life. That's that's the sanctification process. Yeah. To which you were called. That's justification. God is the one who did the calling. He's saying here, you take hold of that. That is part of the sanctification process. Yeah. It's because you were called, now take hold. Yeah. Because he showed you grace, now go work. Yeah. Now go work. And serve him as you're working godly. Serve him faithful. Serve him with love. Serve him with perseverance. Serve him with a sort of gentleness. You know, in the, in the sense of you earnestly stand for the truth. You hold your position that this is the truth. No matter what comes your way, this is the truth. And if the dogs come, you call them out as, as dogs. That's fine. But you don't get yourself to the point to where it turns physical, if you will, or argumentative. and Because it does really no good after that. And you fight the good fight for the true faith. It's like you said, you, you hold tightly to that which you've been called. You go and serve. You go and serve Him. Paul at times he, he 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 was tough. I mean he he stood his ground. He stood his ground in the sermons. He stood his ground in the teachings, and he let the cards fall where they may. He wasn't going to bend, and he never bent. He called them out for who they are. You know, there's a few. You know, you mentioned a scripture where you know he said, I, "I turned them over." That's that's tough words. I turned them over. I turned them over to Satan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's the first pope, right? Yeah, yeah. It's like, uh, yeah. I oppose Peter to his face. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's funny, exactly, because I heard people say that, and they bring up that passage of Scripture, but there's a man who, who did it righteously. You know, there's a difference between doing it righteously and using that as, as a verse, because I've heard it said, I've heard it said here the years ago, and I post him right to his face, I let him know what was going on. But, you know, and now what you're doing is you're edifying yourself, you're lifting yourself up to be some spiritual giant, which you're not. You know? Well, well, why did he oppose it? It wasn't over the color of the carpet. No. It was... Yeah. You are compromising justification by... Faith yes. Alone. Yes. You're yes. falling back into a first righteous system. Yes. So I'm opposing you to your faith. Yes. That's how important that doctrine yeah. is. You're, you are exactly right. There's a mountain that's worth dying on, and there's a mountain that's not worth dying on. Justified by faith alone, not of works, is a mountain worth dying on. Fighting that doctrine. Not whether you, somebody should give 10% of their income or, I mean, I've seen the arguments there in the past. And it's just, 
and, and the damage those things do to the church is pretty devastating. You just said it a few minutes ago, and we got to, we entered this day and time where with social media, with the way it is now, to where we got a lot of a lot of bickering going on amongst believers, high profile believers, true believers. We got a lot of bickering going on be, between them, and it's and I'm afraid if it's not brained in as to some sort that it's gonna do no good. Exactly right. Some is worth dying on. Some is just not. You know, we just had the conference this week. You know, you have a you have the Presbyterian that showed up. I, I mean, I don't I don't get where the difference is there. I don't I, I don't as far as you know. I use this word in parentheses, allowing, if you will, but. It's us, it's man that has created this division, if you will. Paul to Timothy, I want you to pursue righteous living, a godly life, faithful life, a life of love, a life of perseverance, a life of gentleness, a life towards Christ in service for Him. Yeah, I want you to fight the good fight. I want you to earnestly stand up for the faith. And just like you said, you know, fight in the sense of not a full blown fist fight. Well, I'm getting a fight, you know, because he said, you know, I gotta fight the good fight. No, an earnestly fight, an earnestly standing for the truth. Not some knock down drag out battle verbally or physically. But a fighting the good fight for the true faith. And earnestly contending for the faith taking hold of eternal life to which you were called and you were made good confession of the presence of many witnesses taking a stand taking a stand In one section of my notes it's the fight the Greek word for fight is to agonize that's where we get our word agonize to agonize over. To agonize over the truth. To not be willing to bend over man is man is saved by grace through faith alone. You agonize over that. You 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 willingly stand. You fight that fight. He says in verse 12, as you continue on, fight the good fight, take hold of eternal life. Take hold of eternal life. 
to get a grip, if you will, to get a grip of, of, of the eternal matter, to get a grip of eternal matter, to, to understand where you're at, Timothy, to understand the battle, the struggle, to understand it. To put in the hearers around you doctrinal truth. We've said it before. Deeply rooted conference is not based on just allowing or bringing people together where seven or eight speakers every year can get up there and speak. I mean, it it's done to what? To bring doctrinal truth, to understand and to bring doctrinal truth to those around us within the community and beyond. To not be the next G3, but it's to, 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 to bring doctrinal truth into the community. In an area where, especially in our area, I'm sure others too, no doubt, where there's a lack of doctrinal truth. But to be that light, to bring doctrinal truth, to understand the, the impact that needs to be made, to understand the struggle, to not bring light to the conference per se, but to bring light to Christ. And through that, the conference grows to glorify Christ. From Knoxville to wherever and in the years to come, Lord willing, beyond. That's what it's for. To hold tightly to the eternal life which God has called you. Which you, Timothy, have declared. You've declared so well before many witnesses. Before many witnesses. I charge in the presence of God. Gives life to all eternal. Who gives life to, to all things. And Christ Jesus who testified of a good confession before Pontius Pilate in verse 13. You declared this so well in verse 12. You made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Jesus Christ who testifies the good confession before Pontius Pilate. Well, it's just what I read in the Apostles' Creed. Yeah. Under yeah. Pontius Pilate. Yep. Yeah, well, it's like, I think The what? The pilot stone. Yeah. Yeah, I thought so. Uh, yeah. You know, he's showing this is, he really suffered in real history under real historical figures. He was a real man. Yeah. He's joined forever to be. And show this is real history. Yeah. And that, that's what a lot of mentions. Christianity and liberalism was about that it was real facts about real history that happened and it wasn't just some story it's not a fairy tale it's no. the real deal no. and that's you know you honestly fight to, and that's one of the things that you honestly fight about you honestly agonize over you honestly earnestly contend for the faith is that what is that scripture from Genesis to Revelation is true it's 100% accurate it's really happened and it's really going to happen. Well, it's like every time that an archaeological discovery happens, what happens? It confirms scripture. Yeah. We don't need archaeology to confirm scripture because we know it's all breathed out by God. But imagine that. You know, I think a few years ago they found uh, a rock or something that had an inscription about King David. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, yeah, duh. The Bible says happened, it really did happen. Yeah. You know, your little rock you found is great, but we don't need your rock to believe that the scripture is real. Yeah. Same thing with the pile and stuff. Hey, that's great.
great. Paul sounds great. He testifies that scripture is accurate. The scripture doesn't need a rock to mm-hmm. say it's accurate. Yeah. No. You know, these things are God's grace, God's mercy in our lives today. One of the things today, so how is that? Because, you know, it, the Lord is showing, listen, these things really happen. I'm giving you physical evidence today of something of, of three, four, five, six thousand years ago. I'm bringing physical evidence to light. To show you. Redeemer of the world. But the problem with mankind is this man loves his sin. He loves it. He loves it. You know somebody, you have a family member or a friend that that they just find themselves over and over and over again in you know, of course, in their lost state, and they just it's just a constant living a life for this world but that's that's man man loves his sin Paul to Timothy fight the fight agonize over it hold tightly get a grip on the things that are important what you have declared so well before many witnesses in verse 12, he's saying. Now I'm charging you before God, who gives life to all before Christ Jesus, who gave a good life to all before Christ, and who gave a good testimony before Pontius Pilate. That what, in verse 14, that you keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. That you keep what I've told you without wavering. That you keep what I told you without wavering. That's what he's saying. That you keep it without wavering. That you persevere. Move on. Do not waver. You do not throw in the towel. You fight it. You do not walk away. Let no one find fault with you now until the Lord Jesus Christ comes again. To the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a massive amount of churches this morning as we come here to worship in our own state of loan where the pulpits are empty. They'll be filled with men that will stand in and but they're empty of a of a pastor. Many men have walked away and some walked away, not walked away, but some resigned for good reasons in different areas of ministry, whatever, but for the most part they've they just walked away and we leave the flock empty. All saying, you keep what I've taught you. You keep what you've been taught. You persevere. You do this without wavering. Till the Lord Jesus Christ calls you home or he comes back. It's not an option. Not an option. Not an option in this deal. You don't get to set a date or a day. Well, you know, I'm shooting for the golden age of 62 or 64 or 70. You don't get that option. 
And then I'm just going to walk away from this deal and I'm just going to kick back and find me a little place just to tuck myself in nice and neat for the next 10 or 15 years. You don't get that. Now, if the Lord takes you from it and places you in that situation, that's fine. But, Timothy, you don't have that option. None of us should. We fight the fight. We keep the faith. We earnestly contend for the truth. We do it with love and care for those who were battling against. Care for their physical. No, we care for what? Their spiritual. We care for their spiritual over everything. Because we know what's going to happen if they do not turn from their evil and wicked ways and turn to Christ. We know that the end result will be utter destruction no matter how great he or she is here on the earth. So Timothy, I ask you to do this. I command you to do this without wavering. To keep Christ in mind to keep Him foremost in your ministry for Him. For after all, it's not even your ministry, it's Him. He's allowed you to do what He's allowed you to do. You do this so that nobody can find true fault in you, true accusations, whatever it is. And this, I mean, there's always going to be fault, in that, fault with you as long as you live in a sinful body, but those that just keep you from ministry work. Those faults that keep you from ministry work, those sins that devastate, that keep you from serving in certain areas of ministry and one of the biggest ones that I could think of in our life is sexual sins or adultery or turn into a drunk. shatters the service for Christ and affects the church. It's like cancer. It spreads through the church and the neighborhood is like, there they go. The pastor is caught with another woman and it's, they find fault with him and the church is affected. And Using that as an example, Paul says, let nobody find fault with you. He calls you home when the Lord Jesus Christ comes again. These are words for Timothy and these are words for us this morning as I close our final instructions, Timothy's final instructions. Let us pursue righteousness. Let us pursue godliness. Let us serve in deep faith, deep love, deep perseverance, the kindness with the gentleness, but yet forcefulness without wavering for the glory of Christ. Amen. We'll take a few minutes, okay?